nicest things in the world? It's our grandmother. Our grandmothers are warm and they know lots of stories to tell and they have soft laps to sit on. Grandmothers also smell good. And my grandmother always smelled like cookies. And when my parents weren't looking, she would slip me secret spending money. And when I was in trouble with my parents, she could always think of something to say to make me feel better. But the nicest thing about my grandmother was that she was always home. Now, the rest of the family could be running all over the state, but grandmother could always be counted on, sitting there on her porch. That's why I like today's book, A Grandmother for the Orphelines, by Natalie Savage Carlson. Now, this is about a lot of children, 51 of them, who didn't have a grandmother. They were orphans, orphelines in French, and they lived in a large French castle. The head of the orphanage was Madame Flateau, and she was sort of like a mother to all the children, and the gardener, Hubert, was sort of like a father. But they all wanted a grandmother, someone older, someone warmer and softer. And the youngest of the Orphelines was Josine. Now, she wanted a grandmother worse than all the rest. And every time an older lady would visit the orphanage, she would beg her to stay there and be their grandmother. Well, most people have busy lives. They can't stop everything they're doing and move in and be a grandmother to 51 orphans. But one day, Josine went to talk to Hubert, and it just happened, at that moment, his aunt was visiting. And the minute Josine saw her, she thought, there's the perfect lady to be our grandmother. This is my aunt, Tante Claudine, said Hubert. She came to see the farm. Josine made a polite curtsy. Hubert continued. And this is Josine, Tante Claudine, our littlest orpheline. Oh, such a dear, sweet child. I'm sure she will take me to the castle to call on Madame Flateau. Josine was more than happy to oblige. Are you going to be our grandmother? She asked happily as they climbed over the stone wall. Tante Claudine took her by the hand. Perhaps for a few minutes. Uh, I would love to be the grandmother of such a darling little girl. Josine was encouraged. Tante Claudine must have such a big, soft lap when she sat down. And what was even better, she smelled like cakes and tarts. Perhaps she would be willing to stay on longer than a few minutes. Together they went to the kitchen where Madame Flateau was ready to bake some apple tarts herself. This is Tante Claudine, Josine did the introducing. She's Hubert's aunt and maybe she's going to be our grandmother. The two women pumped and pumped each other's hands. Each asked how it was for the other, and only Madame Flateau complained of bunions. When they finally parted hands, Madame Flateau said to Josine, Kelly has been called to Paris because of the illness of her uncle, so you must show Hubert's aunt the castle. I'm sure she will be enchanted by it. Josine guided Tante Claudine down long halls and opened door after door. At the great hall, she said, This is where we have parties. She pointed to the portrait of Napoleon over the fireplace. He can keep warm there, and that's a stag's head by the stairs, but, but we don't all know what happened to the rest of him. They walked up and passed a closed door. Well, that's the schoolroom where the girls are now. We can't go in there or the teacher will scold us. Oh, she wouldn't scold such a dear sweet child like you. Oh, won't you stay forever and be our grandmother, please, pretty please? Oh, I'd like to, child, but my job is in Paris. I am pastry cook in a bakery, the best in the city. Oh, how wonderful it would be to have a pastry cook for a grandmother. Even better than the candy woman. Now I'll take you down to see the dungeon, Josine said. Oh, how fearsome. You barely isn't scared. He keeps some of his tools down there. They went down a winding stone stairway whose chill could be felt even through the soles of their shoes. The air grew dank, and the only light came from a lantern that Hubert must have forgotten to put out when he was last there. Josine stopped at a battered oaken door with a small square hole cut in it. 
She pulled the bolt and swung it open. Go inside. See what it's like. Oh, no, no. Such a creepy place. Oh, it isn't creepy anymore now that you've barely cleaned out the cobwebs. Please, go inside. You'll find out it's real cozy. Please? She gave Tante Claudine her most winning smile. Pretty please with pink frosting on it? Tante Claudine hesitated. Then she patted Josine's curly head. How could anyone refuse such a dear sweet child's whim? She gingerly stepped into the dark cave. Then Josine stepped back, swung the door shut, and pulled the bolt. I'll be back and let you out in a little while, if you promise to be our grandmother. She ran up the steps and went back to the kitchen to give Tante Claudine time to agree. Where is Tante Claudine? asked Madame. The tarts are in the oven and I'm brewing a pot of coffee for her. I don't think she's ready yet, said Josine. I'll get her soon. Some of the other Orphalines arrived before Tante Claudine, drawn by the sweet smell of baking tarts. But before the pastries were done, Hubert came rushing in with bulging eyes. Something's in the dungeon. I went down to get the hammer and I heard moaning and banging. Oh, la, la, cried Madame Flateau, throwing her arms into the air. Monsieur de Copil did not tell me the castle was haunted. Ghosts, shrieked the Orphalines in alarm. Madame Flateau tried to allay their fears as well as her own. Now, ghosts are nothing to fear, children. They are really quite harmless. She straightened her shoulders and the braid on her head. We, we will go right down and find out what the ghost wants. Perhaps he wasn't buried in the right place. She and Hubert led the procession to the head of the stair that led to the dungeon. Behind them came the Orphalines on tiptoe. Josine reluctantly followed them. But when the dungeon door was unbolted, a very live person burst out. It was Tante Claudine, ruffled as a setting hen pulled off her nest. She shook her many pounds and chins and made angry, clucking sounds. That child! That wicked, evil child shut me up in there! Her fiery eyes found Josine. She pointed an accusing finger at her. Poor little Josine. She nearly caused a disaster. And all because she wanted somebody to love. Well, after that, she stopped her search for a grandmother for a while. Plus, Christmas was coming, and there were lots more things to think about. And a new girl, Kaylee, came to live at the orphanage. Now, she came from a different part of France, so she had lots of stories that the other children hadn't heard. She told them one special story about the animals on Christmas Eve. Now, according to her story, the animals, like the cows and horses and oxen and donkeys, on that one special night were given the gift of speech, and that if you went down to the barn, you could actually hear them talking to each other. Well, the orphanage had a large barn and lots of animals, so Josine begged Brigitte to go with her down to the barn on Christmas Eve to see if they could hear the animals talking. Brigitte helped Josine over the stile and held her closely as they approached the barn. They halted in the barnyard for a few moments to gain courage. Then they went to the door that opened to the box stall where the oxen and donkey were kept. Brigitte pressed her ear against the door crack. Below her head was that of Josine, who had so often listened like this through doors. There was only an occasional snuffle or the soft rustle of hay. I don't hear anything, whispered Josine in disappointment. Let's go back, suggested Brigitte. I'm cold. No, refused Josine. I'm not going back until I hear them talk. They put their ears to the crack again. They gasped as a voice came from within. Are you awake too? Yes, it's the church bell that woke me. It must be Christmas. That must be one of the oxen, whispered Brigitte excitedly. Let's go in and tell them it woke you up too, suggested Josine, her hand fumbling for the wooden hasp that fastened the door. No, no, said Brigitte. Not yet. The first voice spoke again. I'm too tired to sleep. It was a long, hard road today. Brigitte whispered. That's the donkey. You bear drove him into the village today. The voice continued. And we've had so little to eat. And so weak. I don't know how much longer I can go on. Josine whispered. 
Hubert must have forgotten to feed them. A few more words were exchanged between the beasts. Then the Orphalines heard the ox grumble. They have no love for us. They are heartless. Brigitte was indignant. To think they've been so mistreated and we didn't know anything about it. Well, the donkey should have told me that time I tried to talk to him, declared Josine. It's his own fault. Then the donkey's voice said, Don't be too harsh on them. Maybe they don't realize how badly they've used us. Josine's fingers reached for the hasp again. Let's go in and tell them. We'll see they're treated better. No, said Brigitte. We must get Madame. She will be able to help them because she has authority. Hand in hand, they scurried back to the castle. Josine fell down twice, but Brigitte dragged her back to her feet. They shoved the front door open, not caring that it creaked loudly. Up the steps to Madame's door, they hurried. They banged on it. Wake up, Madame, wake up! They shouted together. The snoring ended in an abrupt snort. In a minute, Madame appeared in the doorway. Her wrapper was inside out, revealing the frayed seams. On one foot was a fleece-lined shoe, and on the other a felt carpet slipper. Who has fallen down the steps now? Josine tugged at her wrapper. The beasts are talking in the barn. Come listen to them. Madame tried to calm them, as well as herself. You have had a nightmare. Go back to bed. But the children were so insistent that they really had heard them that Madame Flateau began falling under the spell of this magic night of the year. She went to the chest for her heavy coat. I'll get the lantern in the kitchen, but we must be quiet. We don't want to awaken the other Orphalines or Kalig. They are so excitable. We must be calm. Her hands were trembling so much that two matches went out before she could get the wick lighted. They didn't really need the lantern outside because of the moonlight. Madame was in such a crisis of nerves that the Orphalines each took her by an arm to help her along and her mismated shoes made getting over the style difficult. The bees say they're ill-treated and don't get enough to eat, Brigitte informed them as they entered the barnyard. Hello, groaned Madame Flateau. We should never have hired a Breton girl. She has even bewitched the beasts. When they reached the stable door, Madame put her ear to it to satisfy herself that the children hadn't really been dreaming. Three ears, one above another, heard the voices. We must save our strength to get to Paris. Things surely won't be as bad there, even if we have to beg on the streets. Josine tried to imagine a donkey walking down the Grand Boulevards of Paris on his hind legs with a white satin-lined basket held between his front hooves. Madame grabbed the hasp and swung the door open. The lantern light fell on the donkey, lying with his legs doubled under him. One of the oxen was clumsily rising to his knees, and the other was standing with his head braced against the manger. Madame Flateau confronted them. Who has been talking? She demanded as sternly as Mademoiselle in the classroom. What do you think? Were those animals really talking? Well, you're going to have to read the book to find out. A Grandmother for the Orphalines by Natalie Savage Carlson. <laughs>